read through Psalm 6, uh, just um, sit back and listen, and then we will um, take it uh, pretty much verse by verse, looking at what Psalm 6 is saying to us. All right, Psalm 6. In this particular uh, translation of Scripture, uh, the psalm is titled, Prayer in Distress. We will find this theme, prayer in distress, uh, is very consistent throughout uh, the penitential psalms. Do not reprove me in your anger, Lord, nor punish me in your wrath. Have pity on me, Lord, for I am weak. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are shuddering. My soul, too, is shuddering greatly. And you, Lord, how long? Turn back, Lord, rescue my soul. Save me because of your mercy. For in death there is no remembrance of you. Who praises you in Sheol? I am wearied with sighing. All night long I drench my bed with tears. I soak my couch with weeping. My eyes are dimmed with sorrow, worn out because of all my foes. Away from me, all who do evil. The Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord will receive my prayer. My foes will all be disgraced and will shudder greatly. They will turn back in sudden disgrace. Psalm 6, first of the penitential psalms. So let's, let's take a look at it and parse it just a little bit uh, verse by verse. The, uh, the opening verses uh, cry for mercy. Um, Do not reprove me in your anger, Lord, nor punish me in your wrath. Anger, wrath, punishment. The psalmist is saying, look, I know I've messed up. I've, I've messed up. I'm sorry. Don't be angry with me. Don't punish me. The psalmist is afraid of the wrath of God, all right, and, and knows that that wrath could justly fall on him for what he has done. Uh, the third verse, uh, acknowledgement of weakness and of a need for healing. Have pity on me, Lord, for I am weak. Heal me, for my bones are shuddering. This, uh, this uh, uh, allusion to the shuddering of the frame, of the bones, and of the soul of the psalmist um, leads us into uh, a third consideration in this psalm, which is uh, that the effects of sin uh, on us are, are grave and debilitating. My soul too is shuddering greatly. Lord, how long? Turn back, rescue my soul. The, uh, the, the psalmist is, is shuddering because of the weight of sin, because of the guilt that the, the sin has placed upon the psalmist's shoulders. He is, he is shuddering and, and is trusting on the Lord to, to lift that weight, that burden of sin, trusting in the mercy of the Lord. Psalm, uh, Psalm 6, verse 6, there's some reasoning going on here with God. Listen, for in death there is no remembrance of you who praises you in Sheol. The, uh, the psalmist is saying, if, if this burden is not lifted, I might die. Lord, what good is that to you? Who praises you in Sheol? Let's take a moment out here just to talk about what uh, the, uh, uh, the Hebrew scriptures mean when they refer to Sheol or the netherworld. Uh, the, um, the general understanding um, among, uh, among most uh, scripture scholars is that uh, in the early times uh, among the Jewish believers, there was not a, a particularly developed understanding of death. There was this shadowy, sort of forgetful, kind of uh, gray, misty, maybe sort of sad, maybe not so sad place called Sheol, where the, um, the shades or the souls of those who had lived um, went about their business, which was really no business at all. Uh, life was over. They, they had gone to the place of the shadows and the, sh the shades. The, uh, um, they, they would sort of float back and forth without a lot of memory even necessarily of the earth. Not particularly remorseful, not particularly hurting, but uh, not alive and vibrant and full of color and hope and joy the way that we can be on earth. This was uh, what, this is, most historians and, and scripture scholars agree, this was the, uh, 
the primitive Jewish understanding of the afterlife. And it corresponds rather well, actually, to the Greek understanding of Hades. Um, not a, not, we sometimes hear Hades and we think hell. No, that's not, that's not what we're speaking of here. A place that you might even associate with limbo. The Catholic Church called it the limbo of the fathers. Well, um, meaning that before Jesus came, before Jesus entered into human life and entered into human death, uh, there, there was uh, no possibility of heaven, and judgment itself had not fallen across the human race yet. Judgment comes with the cross, and judgment comes with God from God uh, uh, and light from light, the Lord of life himself, the one through whom all things were made. When he enters into death, he blows out its flimsy walls, blows them out completely. They fall away into nothingness, and those who wish for the second death, for eternal punishment, are welcome to fall away with them. But those who wish eternal life, those who hear the word of God and can follow it, this is, this is the great, what we call the Holy Saturday theology, that uh, Jesus goes down to the dead, preaches there, and light breaks in that place of shadow and, and uh, uh, sort, of, sort of a gloomy uh, place, suddenly becomes filled with light, the light of Christ himself. And those who can respond to the light do so, and suddenly they find themselves in paradise. So that's our understanding of of, uh, of what happened with Sheol. Now, it's interesting because the Pharisees, who are the advanced party uh, in Jewish thought at, uh, at Jesus' time, the Pharisees believed in an afterlife that looked a lot like the ones that the Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church uh, teaches, an afterlife that includes uh, uh, judgment, heaven, hell, and also a place in between, a place uh, where those who are waiting, awaiting purification, we call it purgatory. Uh, the, um, uh, we know that the Jews uh, just before Jesus believed in it because the second book of Maccabees, uh, 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 chapter 12, verse 46, says they're praying for those who have died, that they might be loosed from their sins. The Pharisees had a belief in the afterlife by Jesus' time. Uh, that was advanced and very much like uh, the, uh, the belief of the, uh, of the Catholic and Orthodox churches and for that matter of all the Protestant churches as well. But uh, early on, when many of the Psalms were written, this was not the understanding. So what the Psalmist is saying here is that, who remembers you, Lord, in that shadowy place, that, that quiet and, and forgetting and forgetful place that we call Sheol? If you want my praise, Lord, you must save me from Sheol. Don't let my soul enter into the netherworld. Save me, Lord. Have mercy on me. All right, again, the, um, uh, the psalmist comes back in verses 7 and 8 to the effects of sin. The psalmist talks about the effects of sin. I am wearied with sighing all night long. I drench my bed with tears. I soak my couch with weeping. My eyes are dimmed with sorrow, worn out because of all my foes. And so we get an idea of what it is that has happened here to the psalmist. Uh, he or she has been opposed, um, has perhaps uh, been compromised in that opposition, has somehow perhaps uh, uh, sinned, um, perhaps in fear, perhaps, as I say, in compromise. With, who, I, we're not sure exactly what the sin is here, but the psalmist understands that he or she is being punished. And look at, look at the contrition. Look at the sorrow. I drench my bed with tears. My eyes are dimmed with sorrow. Now it's important uh, at this point in the psalm also to remember that all of the psalms point directly or indirectly to the coming of the Messiah. And the penitential psalms and the psalms with Lenten themes in particular point to the passion of the Messiah. And this we could understand, remember that scripture is multivalent, all right? Scripture uh, has meanings, uh, personal meanings for us today, meanings for the people at the time it was written, meanings for the people who've lived in between that time and our time, global meanings, and so forth, and meanings for the Christ. All scripture points toward Christ. And uh, the, um, uh, the, the psalmist here, when he says, my eyes are dimmed with sorrow, worn out because of all my foes, this could be, this could be applied 
uh, to our Lord and Savior as he staggered under the weight of the cross. His eyes dimmed with the blood from the, uh, from the, the crown of thorns. His eyes dimmed with the sweat from all that he had suffered already, the scourging, the crowning, the abuse, and, uh, and then falling under the weight of the, of the cross. Perhaps even tears, perhaps even tears dimmed Jesus' eyes as he made his way toward Calvary. Uh, tears of sorrow, the rejection of his own people. Tears also uh, for, for, as he says to the women of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but for yourselves. Because he's worried. He's afraid for those who will not accept the free gift that he is in that very moment offering his life, his blood, everything he has. He's giving to us in that moment, and yet some will turn away. We'll talk more about this later because it's a deeply Lenten theme in the Psalms. The, uh, the, uh, the heartache of the Messiah at the rejection that he will face. We'll talk more about that later. I'm just saying that here in Psalm 6, uh, uh, verses 7 and 8, perhaps we're seeing a, uh, a foreshadowing of, um, of the passion of the Lord. And then um, Psalm, uh, uh, Psalm 6 goes on uh, to, uh, uh, to turn. As, uh, as almost all the Psalms do, to, uh, to praise God, to thank God, and to give joy and thanksgiving to God for, uh, for having heard his prayer and, and having delivered him. All the Psalms but one, and we will look at that one Psalm, uh, at some point turn around. All the laments, all the, all the Psalms of, uh, of sorrow and despair and of uh, the cries to the Lord, you've got to help me. All of them turn around at some point, except one, which we will get to later. So that is uh, Psalm six, uh, of the first of the uh, penitential psalms. We are going to move on now to the second, which is Psalm 32. Psalm 32, titled in this particular, uh, remember the, the, the titles are not, the Jewish writers of the Psalms didn't put the titles there, the, uh, uh, the editors of the particular translations of Scripture did, but here uh, the title is Remission of Sin. So again, a very Lenten theme for a penitential psalm, Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose fault is removed, whose sin is forgiven. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputes no guilt, in whose spirit there is no deceit. Because I kept silent, my bones wasted away. I groaned all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength withered as in dry summer heat. Then I declared my sin to you, my guilt I did not hide. I said, I confess my transgression to the Lord, and you took away the guilt of my sin. Therefore, every loyal person should pray to you in time of distress. Though floodwaters threaten, they will never reach him. You are my shelter. You guard me from distress. With joyful shouts of deliverance, you surround me. I will instruct you and show you the way you should walk, give you counsel with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding. With bit and bridle their temper is curbed, else they will not come to you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked one, but mercy surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous. Exult, all you upright of heart. Psalm 32. So let's take a look at Psalm 32, more or less uh, verse uh, by verse. The opening uh, verse, how blessed we are when the Lord forgives us. There's a beautiful Lenten theme, right? You know, the, the word repent in its, in its etymological origin um, is uh, uh, synonymous with the, uh, the phrase turn around. That's really all it means to repent. It just means to turn around. Come back to me, as the prophet says. Come back to me with all your heart. Here we find the psalmist trusting, trusting that he or she can come back to God and that uh, the, the sin will be removed and that he or she will be blessed in the mercy and the forgiveness of God. Uh, now, interesting, the, uh, the psalmist admits that he kept silent uh, in his sin that he had somehow betrayed the Lord, betrayed other people. You know, our sin has a ripple effect. It goes out. There's no such thing as a private sin. Any sin anywhere 
whether it's a sin of omission, a sin of commission, a sin done in private, a sin done out uh, in the open. Any sin is going to have an effect on other human beings, and it's, it's going to detract from the, uh, from the treasury of grace, whereas a, a good action taken uh, uh, against that sin, uh, a penance, for instance, that might be assigned to us in confession by the priest, uh, restores what was lost. And so the, uh, the psalmist is here uh, expressing that dynamic uh, quite, quite vividly. Because I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Again, uh, as in Psalm 6, this, uh, this image of the bones shuddering, right down to the bones. What's the, you know, in our physical self, what's, what's sort of the, uh, well, what's our skeleton? Our bones, you know, what, 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 what does everything else sort of hang on? Our bones. So to the core of his or her being, the psalmist is saying, I was wasting away. I groaned all day long. Day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength withered as in dry summer heat. Israel, like California, uh, like Texas, a place uh, of dry, uh, dry summer heat uh, uh, and a scorching sun. And the psalmist is feeling that and feeling the heaviness again, wanting God to lift that heaviness. Think of Jesus underneath the cross and what that cross represents. What is, what is the heaviness on his shoulders but the very heaviness that the psalmist here is asking God uh, to, to lift, to take away. And then Psalm, uh, Psalm 32, verse 5, so beautiful. This is all of us need to take, uh, to take heart in this and to, uh, uh, to trust uh, what the psalmist uh, tells us happens here. Then I declared my sin to you. My guilt I did not hide. I said, I confess my transgression to the Lord, and you took away the guilt of my sin. You lifted uh, that weight from my shoulder. And uh, so this is um, uh, a, a promise uh, from the psalmist of the, of the mercy of God and of the power of God to remove uh, the effects, the devastating, the deleterious effects of sin on us. Sin not only affects us spiritually, it usually plays out in emotion, like I say, those ripples that go out and affect other people. It has emotional repercussions. It can even have physical repercussions. And the psalmist here wanting to make clear uh, the, the depth of those repercussions describes these very difficult uh, physical uh, um, uh, sufferings. And they are lifted uh, by the Lord who, who loves and forgives. So then the psalmist uh, uh, in conversation with the Lord, says that everyone should do what I've done. Every loyal person should pray to you in time of distress. And here's what the psalmist is really saying to us. Uh, okay, so your distress was brought on by your sins? Okay, so you're being punished because you're guilty and you deserve the punishment? Pray to God anyway, don't let your sins, don't let your sins stand between you and God. That's what the psalmist is telling us. Sometimes, you know, as a priest, I hear people in confession, good people, people with deep, strong consciences who feel the weight, the weight of their sins on their shoulders, telling me, Father, I don't think I can be forgiven for this. Oh my goodness. <laughs> don't you believe that? Not for one minute. Don't you believe that? You can't take Father Jim's word for it. You take the word of the psalmist who wrote Psalm 32. Might have been David. We don't know. You take the word of the psalmist. Then I declared my sin to you, and you took away the guilt of my sin. Therefore, every loyal person should pray to you in time of distress. Though floodwaters threaten, they will never reach them. You are my shelter. You guard me from distress. With joyful shouts of deliverance, you surround me. That's the joy of the soul that has admitted his or her uh, darkness, his or her uh, offense, betrayal of the good, betrayal of others, betrayal of God and his love. When, when the person turns around, repents and comes back, the joy, the joy that the person uh, feels. The psalmist wants us to trust in that dynamic. Don't let your sins come between you and the love and the mercy of God. What did Jesus take those, those sins on for? Why did he let that heavy burden, the cross, be laid across his poor, bruised, bleeding shoulders in order that our sins will not come between him and, and us? 
that we will trust in his love and turn, just as the psalmist does here. Mercy is a deep, deep attribute of the, of the uh, Jewish faith in God. From the earliest times, the Jews had the greatest faith in the mercy of God. When Abraham is bargaining with God uh, to try to save the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, he's trusting in the mercy of God. And he is our father, the father of the Jewish people, the father of the Christian people, the father of the Muslim people, Abraham, uh, the, who is the father of all the monotheistic Western religions, trusts in the mercy of God. And the, the psalmist here tells us, you trust too. You trust too. Don't let your sins come between you and God. And then the psalmist says that, uh, that in, in gratitude and uh, in the desire uh, to help others, uh, to, to discover the joy and the release that he or she has found, the psalmist says, I will instruct you. Now the psalmist is speaking directly to us. And see, the Psalms do instruct us. They are indeed that meditation upon uh, the law and the word of the Lord that Psalm 1 advises us uh, to, to follow. They are that meditation. I will instruct you, says the Psalmist, and show you the way you should walk. Give you counsel with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or mule without understanding. With bit and bridle their temper is curbed, else they will not come to you. Don't be like that. Don't be coerced or cajoled or come to the Lord freely. Come to the Lord trusting. It does not matter what your sin is. You know, the, the problem with poor Judas was he thought his sin could not be forgiven. What was the difference between Judas and Peter? Peter who betrayed Jesus three times and then went away and wept bitterly. Peter came back. He trusted. Jesus will forgive me. Peter trusted what that meant to Jesus. Why did he hang on the cross to begin with? precisely for moments like that, not just in the life of Peter or he had hoped in the life of Judas, but in our lives too. Trust, trust, trust in the mercy of God. Lord, do not punish me in your anger. In your wrath, do not chastise me. Your arrows have sunk deep in me. Your hand has come down upon me. There is no wholesomeness in my flesh because of your anger. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. My iniquities overwhelm me, a burden too heavy for me. Foul and festering are my sores because of my folly. I am stooped and deeply bowed. Every day I go about mourning. My loins burn with fever. There is no wholesomeness in my flesh. I am numb and utterly crushed. I wail with anguish of heart. My Lord, my deepest yearning is before you. My groaning is not hidden from you. My heart shudders, my strength forsakes me, the very light of my eyes has failed. Friends and companions shun my disease, my neighbors stand far off. Those who seek my life lay snares for me, they seek my misfortune, they speak of ruin, they plot treachery every day. But I am like the deaf, hearing nothing. Like the mute, I do not open my mouth. I am even like someone who does not hear, who has no answer ready. Lord, it is for you that I wait. O oh, Lord, my God, you respond. For I have said that they would gloat over me, exult, exult over me if I stumble. I am very near to failing. My wounds are with me always. I acknowledge my guilt and grieve over my sin. My enemies live and grow strong. Those who hate me grow numerous fraudulently, repaying me evil for good, accusing me for pursuing good. Do not forsake me, O Lord my God. Do not be far from me. Come quickly to help me, my Lord and my salvation. Psalm 38, all right, now this psalm uh, can be interpreted on two levels uh, very quickly and very easily. We'll look at the first level and then the second. The first level is uh, our level, the human level, uh, the human being who has sinned and regrets and turns to God uh, uh, crushed by the weight of his or her sin. The second level is the level of the Messiah in his passion. 
And so we'll look at both those as we go through talking about the, uh, the psalm. Uh, the first five verses give an acknowledgement of guilt, all right, as the other penitential psalms do. Um, but there is a already, in the very first verse, there's a, there's a plea with God, uh, almost a demand. Do not punish me in your anger, in your wrath. Do not chastise me. Your arrows have sunk deep in me. Your hand has come down upon me. We may infer from the way that the uh, psalmist is writing here that the sin is serious. This is, uh, this is uh, perhaps is King David. We know he wrote a lot of the Psalms and we know he was a serious sinner. I'm gonna talk about that shortly. It may be King David, it may be someone else. Uh, uh, but as I say, the Jewish people had a, they had a strongly developed sense of sin and its offense uh, to the community and to God. And they have a strongly developed sense of God's mercy and God's willingness to forgive and, uh, and God's love. And the psalmist trusts in God in spite of the deep sin which has caused these, these um, uh, uh, festering and foul wounds of which the uh, psalmist speaks, the burning of the loins and the fever and the, uh, uh, the, the, the lack of health, the lack of wholesomeness anywhere in the flesh, the shuddering right down to the bones. Again, the effect of sin on the sinner being described so vividly here in spite of the depth uh, to which this psalmist has fallen. He or she rises in confidence and more than trusting in the mercy of God actually seems almost, the relationship with God is so strong and so good that the psalmist seems almost to, uh, uh, to demand, to demand that God stop, relent, enough. I can't take any more. We read the entire psalm all the way through and, and uh, several times the psalmist seems to be telling God, I can't take any more punishment. You've got to let up. You're going to, you're going to crush me to the ground. And um, so the, the psalmist has a, a relationship with God in which he or she feels confident telling God, enough already. I acknowledge my guilt. Your arrows have sunk deep in me and there is no wholesomeness anywhere in my flesh. Let up. Let your servant rise again. I'm trying to do good now. I've turned back to you. My enemies are legion. And, and they oppress me, and I need your help. The psalmist is almost demanding that God not overlook the sin, but forgive and forget, all right? Let it go now, all right? Please, I've had enough. Do we have the confidence to talk to God like that when we come to him in confession? I mean, we should. We should. Um, I, I we'll talk about innocent suffering later on in the talk, but. Right now I want to talk about when we're suffering and we know that it's been brought about because of our, of our sinfulness. Uh, if you are at a point with it where you think you can't take any more, but you think it would be presumptuous to say to the Lord, enough? Well, think what this psalmist says, Psalm 38. The psalmist has a great obvious confidence in his or her relationship with God and says, I can't take any more. Please, please, Lord, let up. You're going to crush me. I, I, I'm, at, I'm, I'm at the end of my rope. Please, Lord, please relent. It's all right to talk to the Lord that way. He doesn't want you crushed because of your sins. He wants you to turn to him in confidence as this psalmist does.